In the last video I offered you a kind of philosophy that might be appropriate for the end times and that's the philosophy that all that matters is the ripeness. The ripeness is all. What that really means is that life is really just a kind of a carnival, a kind of um, amusement park or fairground and to get the most out of it you want to have done every ride that you want in that theme park. Um, you want to have the best time you possibly can uh, before the the park closes and the idea is that if you live fully and enjoy every ride um, yeah that's a good philosophy to go out on. The idea is that you you finish off when the park closes uh, you're done you you've had you've done all the rides that you wanted and you are kind of fulfilled so you end on a high note a fulfilled note and detach from the theme park and that's really what the philosophy is, is about as opposed to think of say the life hating uh, John in the Bible uh, that's the opposite that's nihilism uh, it's a very negative way to go out on and it seems like it's a poor show to me. It's a poor philosophy of life. The Christian philosophy of life is a dismal one. It's really just for slaves. So to achieve a full life in the time that we have left, it's kind of difficult because it, it's very easy to start focusing on the collapse and get into depression and really devalue the last time you have uh, rather than enjoy it like uh, a temporary and fleeting ride in a theme park just you know the transience of it all uh, is a beautiful thing but it can get lost in in focusing on the ending so yeah that's the basic philosophy but to achieve it and not get depressed uh, is really quite a tall order and I'll tell you one thing that could possibly help you and that's uh, meditation. So if you know how to meditate and you've been instructed say you've had mindfulness training or you've had a guru or something like that um, the chances are that you've been taught wrong the chances are that you've been taught something other than meditation. So what I mean by meditation is the traditional yogic meditation that has been really corrupted in the West. It's been uh, commercialized. Any yoga exercise you've come across in the West is just a stretch exercise that was invented around the 1920s. Um, it's, it's got no tradition really behind it. It's just commercial and it's fake. Um, and as for things like Qigong, um, Qigong is invented in the 1950s and is about as commercial as Coca-Cola. So there's no esoteric knowledge or tradition behind what you consider yoga. What yoga is, is really Raja Yoga. So it's almost the exact opposite of what you think yoga is all about. So yoga is not about stress relief, it's not about relaxation. Uh, it's traditionally been called the Raja Yoga which means yoga for a king. It's a um, yoga to make you into a king. It's subversive. So the yoga you're taught for stress relief and relaxation is the opposite. It's to make you more docile, more amenable. Companies like mindfulness training, they like stress relief training um, which is a misnomer called uh, meditation but really it's so that they can put more stress on you, they can exploit you as a wage slave that much more if you know techniques that where they can cope with the stress they're putting on you. So really uh, a horrendous thing and people should rebel against having uh, things like meditation taught in the workplace if it is a relaxation technique because they're just using it to exploit you more. Uh, it's very common to have people in uh, modern times uh, that are, have a spiritual bent and particularly a bent towards Eastern religions to assume that yes they blissing out on meditation and that's not what meditation is for. 
it's really the way to think of it more is uh, doing reps in a gym it's more like exercise it's an exercise for your mind and what that exercise is is to yoke your alien cortex to bring it under control um, if you've been taught yoga with a mantra <clears throat> if you've been given a secret word that was also since ancient times it's just a gimmick um, yeah forget your mantras all the mudras and you know hand gestures and all the things that you are supposed to do in, in meditation you can forget all of those they're all fake um, since uh, the Vedic times yeah they were used to con people so the, it, it's really a magic spell so the guru uh, really a charlatan would tell you there's a secret word it's a spell that's going to do all sorts of things for you and you can use these spells to meditate um, <clears throat> really it's a trick you can use anything you like as a mantra and it wouldn't make a blind bit of difference there's there's no quality of sound or as sorry if you've been told all that nonsense but it's just BS um, so what is real meditation well uh, it's all about the phosphines so how to meditate is is simple it's, it's you you follow the light so it's all about phosphines it's seeing the light behind your eyes so you sit uh, comfortably with your spine straight and you can see phosphines behind your eyes so what's the point of phosphines well I was uh, really amazed once in San Francisco um, when I moved there with my family we went to Alcatraz just to do the tourist thing and on one uh, in the low season uh, went and did an audio tour and came to the cells for solitary confinement and I was truly amazed because in the auditory explanation that um, that I had the audio recording had the voiceover of one of the prisoners that were put in solitary confinement there in Alcatraz and there in this kind of broad Bronx accent uh, he was saying relating how he actually quite liked being solitary confinement because you could shut your eyes and he said there's this kind of light show that you can see um, all these kind of fireworks show behind your eyelids and it's very enjoyable so that truly amazed me I since found out that there's something called it's a well-known effect and it's called the prisoner's cinema so if you go back to I made a brief mention of uh, the cave um, Plato's cave <clears throat> and everybody is chained lined up looking at the wall and seeing shadows on the wall and then that is considered to be a theater it's really a movie theater and this is the same so yes what are all those lights well if you put a bit of pressure on your eyelids you can probably see phosphines it's it looks like a little light show and I wouldn't recommend pressing on your eyeballs to meditate I would recommend just sitting uh, with your hands probably in your lap um, as I'll explain but if you concentrate hard between your eyes you may start to see some lights it's easier for for kids to do it um, than it is for adults uh, but those are called phosphines and they really are lights a lot of people think that they um, imaginary but no they are bioluminescence in your retina so they're not fake lights uh, they're not imaginings they are genuine photons being released through bioluminescence so what you're doing by concentrating on that light in meditation and enhancing it is raising your serotonin levels and so serotonin it signals your brain about resource availability so it's particularly sensitive to uh, the light dark signals um, for example uh, in hamsters um, after the equinox the ratio of daylight to nighttime 
uh, signals uh, uh, gonadotropins, I think they called, but they signal really the mating season. So they give hamsters mojo, and the same applies to humans. Resources in terms of abundance of food and social dominance release serotonin. And people are cued to look for signals of serotonin in other people. And one of the signals is a deeper voice. So if you want to fool people into thinking you're the boss, in other words, you're the person that has all the serotonin, you can fool people by lowering your voice a few octaves. It was actually done by Elizabeth Holmes. She lowered her voice so that she could seem more like the boss. It's, it's a well-known technique. I even Morgan Friedman went to coaching lessons to get that deep gravelly voice of his. And the reason is that you can make a career out of it. Because when people think that you're the boss and you're the king of the hill, they tend to actually give you resources. So it's the exact opposite of what you'd expect. If you're an underdog, uh, people's charity is not as big as what they'll give to the boss because they expect a bigger return from the boss. But you can make a successful career out of fooling people that you have all the serotonin. And particularly uh, in males, they can fool females into thinking, you know, I'm, I'm the, the main guy, um, I'm Mr. Big, uh, and they exude uh, all these signals for high serotonin levels. And that uh, you can assume is because it's uh, signals that I have all the resources, therefore I have all the serotonin. And particularly women are looking for uh, a partner that has resources. So yeah, that's the conventional wisdom of, of what's going on with serotonin. So serotonin is very undemocratic. In most animals, it really reflects how much resources you have. So if you're feeling rich, if you're feeling on top of your game, if you actually are an authoritarian, then you have more serotonin than other people around you. And they probably have more cortisol and more stress hormones. So yeah, that's something that anarchists don't often talk about is the neurochemistry of authoritarianism. But it is the fact that, uh, yeah, serotonin is not easily shared. So to keep up with the 1%, you can trick your body. You can go and get a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. All the happy pills that you get from Big Pharma are really a trick. They cheat your body and your neurochemistry into feeling that you're rich and you have social dominance when all it is is uh, the SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, they just uh, molecules that fit very neatly into the neurons that absorb the serotonin. So serotonin gets released and then it gives you that feel-good feeling and then it gets cleaned up. So the vacuum cleaners that clean up those serotonin mo molecules get blocked by SSRIs and that's pretty much all big farmers um, kit for making you feel good or tricking your body into feeling uh, that it has resources. Um, it has plenty of food, it has money, and it has high st social status. So it's uh, you just pay money uh, to lie to your body. And that's what all these happy pills and Big Pharma is all about. Antidepressants, they're all really SSRIs. So what's actually happening is the tryptophan gets converted um, through your hypothalamus uh, into serotonin. Now the serotonin is picked up by your pineal gland and your pineal gland, uh, what it does is it stops producing melatonin. So what you're really doing with the meditation focusing on the light is you would get that effect just from a bright light anyway. But this is a, a novel trick. Meditation is really telling your whole body that you're going to sleep. So it sends all the signals for circadian rhythms to say that everything's being dampened down. You're going into a state of sleep. But then, instead of actually going to sleep, 
you focus on that light. That light tells your pineal gland to dampen down on the melan melatonin. Now, if it produced melatonin, that melatonin is really associated with depression. The depression is nature's way of saying, stay in bed. It's saying it's dark outside. There's nothing worth hunting. The gathering is off. Just stay in bed. Now, we call that seasonal affective disorder or SAD uh, because really in capitalism you're supposed to get up and go to the factory come hell of a high water. But nature is telling you with depression is that basically things are not worth getting out of bed for. And so it's a natural response and it's nothing like a disorder. It's actually uh, yeah, people should be responding to their depression by staying in bed. We should be hibernating in the winter. We shouldn't be having artificial lights, getting up, commuting into work and sitting on a treadmill all day, looking at a bright screen um, in the winter time, especially. So what happens now is when you focus on that light, the pineal gland is a tiny little gland right in the center of your brain. It's called a pineal gland because it looks a bit like a pine cone, but it's really about the size of a grain of rice. And it's always been associated with mystical experiences for a good reason, because it's very susceptible to psycho psychedelic drugs. Um, it produces DMT and DMT is a very big trip. So yeah, if you, if you can take DMT, orally is a psychoactive drug and it'll give you the trip of a lifetime and you can produce your own DMT through your pineal gland if it is put under stress. Now meditation uh, can put your pineal gland under stress and give you DMT so you can get a DMT high doing meditation. It's not something to strive for if you try hard to get one of these effects, it'll be counterproductive. But left to itself, these things can arise naturally if you practice uh, meditation enough. So this is what's actually happening. When you look at the phosphines, you look at the lights behind your eye, uh, it is telling your pineal gland through your occipital lobe that there's a strong light, in other words, it's daylight, so don't make melatonin. If melatonin levels decrease, then your serotonin will increase. And that's what makes you feel good. So that's what reduces the depression and makes you feel much better. So if you concentrate on that light, you'll see really what is a mandala. It's um, has these beautiful colors like an acid trip really um, and those are real photons that are being generated by your eye. Now what happens is that when you have any kind of sensory deprivation uh, a lot of feedback comes back to your eye. So we think of the eye as kind of a sense instrument and we think of the nerves just sourcing signals from the eye and sending them to the brain. It's not really quite like that. Uh, most of your senses have a lot of signal traffic going the other way towards the sensor. So for example, your nose uh, has receptors for millions, millions of smells. And all that information would be useless if you didn't have a way of saying, hang on, enhance that. So the most of the signals for your smell are actually going the other way from your brain to your nose. The vast majority of the signals are going in that direction, not as you'd think as a sensor picking up a smell and sending it to your brain. What those signals going back to your sense of smell are doing is saying, this is a salience landscape, pick that one. So it's saying, enhance that. It's, it's saying, in effect, zoom in, enhance that smell. And your eye does much the same thing. So when, it ha when you see these uh, phosphines, it goes back to your brain and your brain then 
gets into a feedback loop and it says enhance that. But since the phosphines are self-generated, the shapes it makes is really a part of your brain. So your brain is in effect looking at a mirror on the inside of your retina. It's possible to easily recreate this effect with a camera and monitor video feedback loop experiment such as this one. And as it makes these patterns, all sorts of areas inside your brain can be activated. So you can see th things like Charles, almost like Charles Bonnet's syndrome, where you start to see people and faces, but really you're getting into the subconscious layers, all the thing, all the parts of your brain that are not normally active, you can suddenly access them because they start to project these visual images right behind your eyelids on this kind of movie screen. And it's self-reinforcing. So this is what was going on for tens of thousands of years back into uh, the late Stone Age. So what the shamans were clearly doing was going into a cave. Now imagine a cave, um, what it represents to a Paleolithic person. The universal religion of that time was the religion of the Earth Mother. So this whole Earth they would consider mom. Now, a cave inside that earth is clearly a vagina in that cosmology. And going into a cave is really going back to your origins. So the idea was really you came out of your mother's womb, but humanity itself came out originally. So your mother would have come out of the earth mother. So we arose from the dirt in that, in that religion. And then we would return back there. And so you see um, Neanderthals and early hominids burying people inside a cave. They're really returning them to their origins. And it survives even today. The reason why we, we bury people in a grave is really harks back um, an echo to that returning to Mother Earth. Um, so w from whence you came. So what the shamans were doing by going into a cave was going back into the afterlife, in effect, the place from where, where we came from and the place where they assumed we would go. In that realm, then, the cave walls, you must kind of think of them as a membrane into the afterlife. So it's kind of almost a stargate. And what they're doing uh, when they put, say, hand patterns that are very common in ancient caves is they really putting their hand up against the glass. So you imagine uh, it's almost like a scenario in a movie where you get a prison visit and somebody walks up and puts their hand on the glass and the other person on the inside of the prison puts their hand up on the glass. Um, and that's pretty much what they're doing is making contact with the other, the other side of this membrane within the cave. So they assume, you know, if you go down in a cave, if you go down deep enough, eventually it will come to an end. And where that end is, they assume then you do a Harry Potter and you go straight through the wall into another dimension. Now, when they were meditating, uh, clearly they were doing exactly what I've been telling you uh, to do in, in meditation by looking at phosphines. So they would look at a blank wall in the cave and exactly the same thing would happen. What happens with phosphines is that they can be generated, uh, say, in pilots often have this. If, they, if there's uh, just a, a, a blue sky without any features, then these uh, phosphine patterns can start to get generated spontaneously. The same can be with, with drivers driving in snow. If you, if you get snow blind, uh, you can also start seeing these dramatic patterns of, of phosphines entirely naturally. So those phosphines would then be generated as you look at a blank wall. 
How do I know this? Because it's still done today. If you go and get esoteric training and you're trained in meditation in the, some of the Eastern traditions, uh, that can be one of the practices you're given uh, is to just stare at a blank wall. And what is happening is slowly you start to see patterns on the wall. Now what they're doing in the caves with cave paintings is they're enhancing them. They're doing exactly the same feedback to the front of your eyelids, but now on a wall of the cave. So you imagine they're sitting there with a small light or a torch and you can see shapes and patterns. They're seeing their consciousness displayed almost like a movie on the cave wall. And then with pointillism, they're putting dots at various places. So there might be shapes in the rock, um, but they would see an almost like an after image superimposed on the rock and they would pick it out slowly with points and enhance it and enhance it. And each time it would get real more and more real. Now, you have to imagine them seeing totems that had a lot of meaning to them, say a horse or something that had a significant meaning to the person that was doing this meditation. And the same thing carries on even today. If you look at Mark Rothko's pictures, people can clearly see that it's something in the abstract that's familiar, but you can't quite put your finger on exactly what it is he's painting. Well, what he's painting is phosphenes. They're geometric in shape because he's filtering them through his alien cortex. And as I mentioned before, the alien cortex adores geometric shapes, particularly the square. But the secret to understanding Rothko is that he's painting phosphenes behind your eyelids in the abstract. About double the number of the symbols inside caves about double the number of pictograms, in other words, things like horses and uh, things from the hunt, um, animals that might, might be hunted, um, or totems for the person actually, <clears throat> that might have special significance for the person that's meditating. Uh, about double that number is just symbols, just abstract symbols. You don't normally see that because uh, the um, documentaries focus on all the nice pictures and they ignore all these symbols. Now there are about 32 symbols that are found all over the world and paleologists assume that they are kind of a writing, they're an early form of writing. Uh, they're not. They are phosphenes. They are really the mandalas that people are seeing inside their brain and yeah if you don't believe me then have a look at this. This is a diagram of electrically induced phosphenes. In the 1970s, Max Knoll and colleagues stimulated about a thousand people with electrical pulses in the 5 to 40 hertz range, roughly the same frequency as brain waves. Everyone saw lights, but about half the test subjects also saw geometric figures if they concentrated carefully. These are the 15 classes of geometric figures that people saw. Just look at the remarkable similarity to the 32 geometric shapes commonly found in cave art for the last 40,000 years. The pictograms in caves are not writing or symbols to be decoded. They're more like a wiring diagram. A wiring diagram of the human brain. In particular, the visual cortex, projected in a feedback loop as phosphenes. They are actually a record of how the human brain evolved and eventually became more and more dominated by the alien cortex, eventually degenerating into writing and representational art that are turning out to be lethal for our species and causing us to go extinct. No doubt, in more innocent times, the shamans that made these images were using the shapes for divination purposes and mistakenly assumed that they were communicating with spirits. But what they are really doing is reading their own minds, much like a Rorschach inkblot test. If only they had seen their alien cortex creeping up on them. So those ancient shamans inside the caves, what they're drawing on the walls are mandalas. And it's still done today. You can still go to India today and you can see uh, mystics and ascetics, um, holy men, drawing mandalas 
and meditating on them. Now the belief is that there are mandalas that if you focus on them they will have different effects. But the mandalas themselves must have been generated by shamans doing meditation against a surface like a wall or the ground and really they're projecting part of uh, your internal neural circuitry onto the ground um, enhancing it by drawing the outline of it and then somebody that say has uh, done a lot of these practices in other words they have a complete brain or rather um, a naturally perfect brain if you can meditate on a mandala that they have done the idea is that you will absorb some of that perfection and if the person is uh, pretty sane and healed you could actually heal yourself by looking at that mandala in other words you're doing a kind of a morgue mind uh, a borg mind meld you're kind of taking up the pattern that this healthy person has in their brain so what's the point of looking at these mandalas and all the wasting time focusing on all these lights? Um, well, to reorganize your brain, and you certainly do want to do that in the condition that it's in. Um, I wouldn't say that you're dying ripe if you go out with your alien cortex looking for a dopamine fix. And that's how most of the people will go. And that is a terrible way to go, as you'll find out shortly. But if you can bring your alien cortex to heal, um, reduce its dominance, uh, and reorganize yourself uh, without the ego of your alien cortex, um, you can really get to a point where you are no longer identified with your common or garden ego uh, the little person, the person that's given a name, this embodied personality and individualism that you have um, is a source of great pain. And if you can rise above it, you almost literally wiring up a third brain. So you have two brain hemispheres and uh, I'll definitely go into the, the popular myth and what is real about the two brain hemispheres but yeah neurologists hate the popular notion of a uh, left and right brain and the right brain's all artsy and the left brain is all uh, mechanical and alien cortex like uh, but yeah, there is a large element of truth to it and it was I'll, I'll go over the experiments the scientific experiments that prove it but while you're addicted to getting these micro hits of dopamine that you get from social media and looking at screens and your cell phone and um, uh, from porn and uh, all these tiny little ways we have uh, of getting dopamine hits that um, really dominate our lives in the Western Hemisphere. If you can stop that addiction uh, and then start to open up the other parts of your brain, uh, your quality of life will improve immensely. It's really like um, getting more real estate uh, for you to experience the theme park that is, is life. So it can be done with um, psychotropic drugs, things like LSD and mescaline. Um, ayahuasca uh, has uh, a lot of these, these elements, uh, psychoactive drugs that uh, and but and DMT in particular but um, you produce those naturally and so it's far better to train and rewire your brain so that you can produce them um, really on demand that's far far better than taking drugs to, to actually uh, just get an, a brief excursion into this fantastic world it's really just like going to the movies and it doesn't last it actually suppresses uh, the because you you have an artificial um, supplement of some of these neurotransmitters the actual manufacturing of those neurotransmitters say like in the pineal gland um, in the hypothalamus and uh, the various glands that produce uh, some of these um, 
neurotransmitters and of, uh, in your endocrine system, the hormones that actually generate some of these, the soup, they actually tone down and scale back because you have an excess of supply from taking these drugs. So the more you take the drugs, the more your ability to produce these chemicals naturally will be reduced and the more you'll have to take those drugs. So yeah, the response dampens down, you get habituated. So I would highly recommend that you don't take the route of artificially stimulating these drugs um, through medication or these neurotransmitters through uh, supplementary drugs and pharmaceuticals. Um, if you spend enough time meditating, particularly on things like the phosphines, they will gradually start to uh, produce um, on, a, on a bigger scale. And eventually you can induce an LSD trip um, or really um, a, psycho, a psychedelic trip from natural chemicals in your brain. But if you've been taking drugs, you probably have to spend years working that out of your system till you can revive your atrophied brain that's been atrophied by too many of these chemicals. Um, pharmaceuticals that are shop bought. Okay, so I will go over how you actually meditate um, and some of the history behind uh, meditation. Uh, it goes far back. Uh, we get echoes from it in ancient Egypt. There are all these hints to what was happening all the way back in shamanic times and then in the esoteric uh, religious tradition in um, the in the mystical schools they've preserved some of this knowledge and so it, you you can find it even today with great difficulty um there's an incredible amount of bs on the internet um and uh wrong knowledge um corrupted knowledge um and yeah it's all this religion of spirituality um, that is uh, it's it's an industry and it's worth worth billions and on one side you've got people teaching yoga and um, on the other side people teaching meditation as stress relief and it's a complete abomination um, but I'm giving you the information that would have been very very hard to get um, in previous Gen generations but now with the internet hey uh, all this stuff is for free uh, <laughs> and yeah in the end times why the hell not um, you know it's not no point in being secretive about it so you yeah um, I will go over how to the postures to adopt and how to actually meditate um, properly uh, assuming that it can really enhance your life and certainly in the end times it's a goal for achieving what I said in the previous video and that's the ripeness is all. So achieving that ripeness has a lot to do also uh, with detachment of finishing off with the theme park and really yeah um, rest after a fun time at the park um, is a beautiful way to go and that's part of ataraxia is to go without attachments to go very detached and that that detachment can only be achieved with a lot of philosophical discussion a lot of ph philosophical inquiry and also some of these techniques and practices one of them I've just given you um, but again uh, meditation a bit like a mirror and so when you're looking at those phosphines behind your eyelids you're looking at a mirror of your own neural circuitry and th that reflection one off another enhances each other in a feedback loop and then you can start uh, to awaken some of these other glands and, and get control and of the, the hormone production in particular um, things like serotonin. So, next time uh, I'll go over some of the postures and history.